We're going to verse 25. Or verse 18 to verse 25. And it reads, 1 Corinthians, first chapter, verse 18. It says, For the preaching of the cross is to them who perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the product. Who is the wise? Who is the scribe? Who is the disputers of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. But it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them who believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greek foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. Amen. We thank God for the reading of his word. Be a blessing unto the hearer. Tonight we're talking about the message of the cross. The message of the cross is the opposite of all that man considers to be true wisdom. The way God has chosen to save the world seems foolish to peoples who do not believe. God wants you to know him. But the world by its wisdom cannot know God. Man cannot accept the fact that he cannot be saved by science, technology, education, or by any human effort of goodness. And no matter what man does or how wise he gets, he will never be able to become perfect. Despite all that man may achieve, he will still come short of the glory of God, which is perfection. The way for man in his world are to be saved is not by the wisdom of men, but by the wisdom of God, which is the cross. The cross is the power of God to save those who believe. And it's the cross alone that can change lives of men. Now, there is a wisdom out there that the world loves. That's why they stay out there, because they love what's being said, what's being done, how life is lived. And it's all according to their own selfish desires and their own selfish ways, refusing to acknowledge God, refusing to get to know God's will. It, 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 it surprises me sometimes when people go to peoples who don't know probably half as much as they know, but yet they will give them their attention and listen to them on things that they haven't experienced and don't even have any knowledge about, and yet they will listen to them. And then those people, sometimes when you tell them the truth or tell them what the Word of God says, those same peoples won't listen to what you're saying. They don't believe that that's God speaking. They don't believe that that's God's Word. They just feel like they know what's best. Now, I say the man who built the engines to the car know more about that engine than anybody because he designed it and he built it. If anything go wrong with that engine, the man who designed the engine and constructed that engine know exactly probably what a problem is because he know everything about that engine. When it comes to our lives, when it comes to our lives, God knows what's best for us. We may think we know what's best for us, but God knows what's best for us. He should know because he designed us, he made us, he know everything about us. He know what's good for us and he know what's bad for us. And if we would listen to him, we would have a good life. But for some reason, the world don't want to listen to what God has to say. But the message of the cross to a lot of people is a lot of foolishness. They don't believe that believing a man who died on the cross for their sins is the way of salvation. But that's the way God designed it, 
And that's the way God set it up. So let's look at verse 18. And it says this here. It says, for the preaching of the cross is to them who perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now, it's, it mentions two different groups of people. Those who are perishing and those who are being saved. <coughs> the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. They are on the road to perdition because the one means able to save them from that trip is the word of the cross. But that word of the cross sounds like foolishness to them. The death on the cross was associated with the idea of all that is shameful and dishonorable. And to speak of salvation only by the suffering and death of a crucified man was absolutely nonsense to the unbeliever. That God would take on human form, be crucified, and raised from the dead in order to provide for man's forgiveness of sin and interest into heaven is an idea far too simple and foolish. That one man could die on a piece of wood on a hill determined the destiny of every person who ever lived seemed stupid to the person who's perishing. See, the thing is, I love about God, and I'm sure you love about God, the most simple of God makes it, the more better it is for me. Because God is the greatest wisdom there is. And he has to really condescend to my level for me to understand. And what God does, even though it might seem foolish to me, is the wisest thing that could ever come to me. But yet there are people who feel like, what God does sometimes doesn't make sense to them. But the thing is this, the two kind of peoples, the one who is perishing, he looks at God's message, he looks at God's word as being foolish. But then there's the other one. He said to those who are being saved, the gospel is the power of God. They hear the message, they accept it by faith, and the miracle of regeneration take place in their lives. It's the power of God that demonstrates itself by saving a sinner. The cross is the power of God simply because it was there that the total sin debt was paid, giving the Holy Spirit freedom to work mightily within our lives. What one group considers foolishness, another group considers God's power. What one group throw aside as foolish prevents it from being saved by the power of God. Now, all God does and all the things that God do, you have to sit back and say, what kind of mind he possessed? Can you imagine some of the little things that God has made in this world? <laughs> he said Solomon in all his glory, I'm pretty sure Solomon probably dressed up nice and looked nice. He said Solomon in all his glory couldn't compare to the ladies of the field. He said, uh, God designs all those. Sometimes you just look at the sky, just look at some of the designs of the clouds. Sometimes you look at the night and look at the stars. You, know, you have to sit back and say, well, what kind of a mind is this? But the thing is that what we consider, the Bible says, even impossible, God said is possible with him. And the power of God is shown in the fact that God can take a man who's a poly would be a maniac considered in our day, and turn him around and make him out of a minister. Make him out of a man that can change other people's lives. God is always showing forth his wisdom and his power in the things that he do. Now, the cross is the power of God because it was by the power of God that we got forgiveness for our sins. It was by the power of God that we are saved today, filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. It's by the power of God that we're able to live the way that we live today. If it wasn't for God's power, we wouldn't be able to walk right. We wouldn't be able to talk right. We wouldn't be able to act right. And I'm telling you, we know those who that believe. We know 
the power of God. We know what God can do. We know what God has done in our lives. So one group, that group that's perishing, they think that God's message of the cross is foolishness. But those who have believed that message, we found out that message to be very powerful indeed. Now, notice the solemn fact in this verse that there are only two classes of people, those who perish and those who are saved. There is no in-between class. Men may love their human wisdom, but only the gospel leads to salvation. Now, you either say, somebody say, or you're not saved. Jesus said, you either with me or you're against me. You either holding to God's word or you're holding to the word of the world. And the thing is that this here, God gives you the freedom to choose which way you want to go. I mean, he can put it out there just as plain as day. Don't eat of that tree. Now, you got millions of other trees that you could choose from. And God said, all I want you to do is stay away from one tree. Now, how simple that could be. I mean, if he said 15 different names and 15 different types of trees, that might have been a little problem. But the fact that he put it to just one tree, it doesn't seem to be difficult. But we sometimes say, no, 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 no. God don't know what's best for me. That one tree is better than all the trees in the garden. And that seems that you say to yourself, now how foolish can you get? If he made every tree, if he planted every tree, and if he's the one causing every tree to grow, don't you know he know what every tree can do and what every tree can't do? But the fact of the matter is, we just don't want to accept his message. So now look down to verse 19. It says, for it is written, he said, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Now, the fact that the gospel would be offensive to human wisdom was prophesied by Isaiah in chapter 29, verse 13 and 14. We're going to read it out of the Message Bible. So the Master say, these people make a big show of saying the right things, but their hearts aren't in it because they act like they're worshiping me, but they don't mean it. He said, I'm going to step in and shock them awake, or stun them. Stand them on their ears. The wise ones who had it all figured out will be exposed as fools. The smart people who thought they knew everything will turn out to know nothing. Doesn't it, doesn't it uh, sometimes kind of flip you out when you see real educated smart people doing some of the stupidest things in the world? You would say to yourself, even common sense should, should let them know that's foolish. But they get so wise until they outsmart themselves. And they're thinking that what they're doing is wiser than what God's word says. Now, these words of God's denouncement of the policy of the wise of Judah and seeking a allegiance with Egypt when they were threatened by Sennacherib. And that's in Isaiah 30. Verses 1 and 2. Let's look at Isaiah verses 1 and 2. Do you have it? Isaiah 30. Verses 1 and 2. God said this. And he was speaking to Hezekiah and his advisors. He said, Whoa! To the rebellious children, says the Lord. He said, who take counsel, but not of me. And who cover with a covering, but not of my spirit. That they may add sin to sin. That walk to go down into Egypt. And have not acts at my mouth. To strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. God said, woe be unto them who take the counsel from the world and not 
seek my counsel. Now, in every situation that you have in life, I guarantee you God got an answer for it. In every problem or everything that confuses you and you don't know no way out, I guarantee you God got a way out. The thing is that this here, when we look at it, it says here in our notes, it says, how true it is that God delights to accomplish his purposes in ways that seem foolish to men. He said Judah would be saved solely by God's power and with no human help. He destroyed 185,000 men of the Assyrian army with just one, an one angel. How often he, God, uses methods that the wise of this world would ridicule. Yet they achieved the desired results with wonderful accuracy and efficiency. God continually told Israel that he would fight for her. All she had to do was trust and obey. How often? You, you seem like, just like Israel in this story. You seem like you are boxed in. You're outnumbered. And there is no way out. You tried everything. See, God was getting that difficult. They tried everything before they come to him. They went to Egypt. They took Egypt money. They were looking for Egypt to deliver them. But Egypt couldn't deliver them. And the thing is that this is him. They was going to everybody but God. And it was Isaiah who said, well, Hezekiah said, he said, why you seek advice from Egypt when you have the living God right here? Isn't that, I mean, it would be like me knowing the word of God is true, knowing God is real, and going to a, a palm reader for advice. Going to somebody who's speaking to the dead and trying to show me the way of life. And here I got a living God, huh? I got the word of God, and I know God is alive. I know his word is true, but I'm seeking advice from people who are not true. People who can't, the Bible says, well, the man who put his trust in men. Men will, how many of y'all have been failed by a man before? I, I can put your hand up because you know. They may say things out of their mouth, but their heart ain't in it. They may act like they with you, then the next moment they are against you. You can't put your trust in man. Man can change. God don't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The thing is this here. Israel was surrounded. And Sennacherib had defeated every other country he had went up against. And it wasn't even a battle. And he was telling the people, say, don't you trust in Hezekiah, what Hezekiah said. He said, because look, I done destroyed all the other people with their gods who they say claim was supposed to be so good. He said, I wiped them all out. He said, I'm going to do the same thing to Judah. And Hezekiah was scared. But Isaiah told him, said, look, when he sent, actually when he finally made up his mind to go to God, when he went to God, God told him something that seemed impossible. God said he won't shoot not one arrow across the wall into the city. He said he's not going to go into your city at all. He said, in fact, the way he came in, is the way he's going to go back without shooting one arrow. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. It's almost 200,000 people is out there, and they are surrounded the city. This is God's word to King Hezekiah. He said, don't you worry. I'll fight for you. You won't even have to fight. Now, you're looking out there. This, is, this, is a, a, this guy has a reputation of destroying countries, taking over countries. Now, God tell you, he's not going to even shoot an arrow over the wall. The thing is this here. What's so hard <coughs> about God's message is that when God gives you the answer to your problem, it sounds ridiculous. I mean, 185,000 men, you telling me they're not going to even shoot an arrow? And they already got the city surrounded? And you telling me they're not going to shoot an arrow across the wall? Now, how much faith would it take for you to believe God's word? You would say, no, that can't be God. No way, no how. And that's where you run into trouble. Because either it's God's word or it's not. If you believe it's God's word, God is no liar. It's one thing the Bible has said. God cannot lie. Huh? When he says it, that's what he's going to do. And so the thing is, the method that 
God told him, like, he said, don't even worry, just, just stay cool. I'll take care of this here. And the thing is with this here, God had a plan that nobody could think of. I know you don't have angels fighting for you. Believe it or not, you do. But you don't think that. All your battles are won by God. You thinking that you fighting? They ain't really you fighting. You thinking that you winning those contests? That's not really you winning those contests. God has you covered. God's got somebody said God got your back in every situation. That you can walk out there with five stones and a slingshot and go up against the greatest warrior that was at that time, and you'll win because why? God got your back, and God will send you out there against a man whose experience has a spear, has a sword, has a shield, and God will send you out there with five rocks and a slingshot and tell you you're going to win. His methods are not like ours. His ways, the Bible says, are not like ours. His thoughts are not like ours. And because he's not, this is why the world fails in his wisdom. They don't try to get to know God. We try to bring God down to our level. This is what I would do. I would send an atom bomb and blow up all those fellas. Isn't that what you would do? I would set their uh, houses on fire or something. That's what you would do. But God said, just, he just like he told Moses at the Red Sea, just stand still <laughs> and just move forward. I, I got this thing covered. God takes over. And the thing is, can we believe that God can handle all of our situations? Do we have the patience to believe that what God has said in his word is actually going to take place in our lives? And so how often he God uses methods that the wise of this world would ridicule. And God, I'm going to tell you why God does it. Have God ever made you out look like a fool? He has. Many a times. I didn't think it would work. I didn't think it could go like that. But it did. And I say, boy, how, how, have you ever said to yourself, how silly could I be? <laughs> have you ever said that to yourself? Because you know God had to told you from the beginning, if you do this here, in a work fight. But you go through all the channels, you go through all the ways, go through all the ups and downs, before you finally say, okay, God, I'm going to try you. And when you try God, these say, oh, man, look at him. Look how stupid I look. See, God got to make your wisdom Look foolish to you so you will trust his wisdom and know that he is right. Know that what he's telling you is the truth. It's hard sometimes for us to just turn our lives over to God and trust God's word for what he says that he's going to do for us. Now, look on down further. Men are inclined to try to solve their problems and fight their battles by their own ingenuity and their own power. How many of us guilty of that? I know I am, huh? Every now and then, I figure, I got, I got it, Lord. I don't need your help. I don't even need to go down and pray about this, Lord. I got it. I know what I'm doing, Lord. And go out there and make a big mess. Make a mess so big that it'll look like if God don't step in, it won't get straightened out. But the thing is with this here, we got to get to a point where we know God is smarter than us. <laughs> Shouldn't be hard for us to figure that one out, but we still sometimes figure we got a little bit more than God do. Huh? But human ingenuity and power only gets in what in god's way man's own efforts hinder god in his work rather than help him for example man's wisdom assures him that he can earn or merit his own salvation the gospel set aside all man's effort to save himself and present christ as the only way to god now a lot of people don't want to accept that but i'm here to tell you Whatever you did and whatever you thought you accomplished, God did it. If you even had an idea that you saved yourself, slap yourself. Because you did not save yourself. If God don't save you, you will not be saved. Now, that's simple to me. I, 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 didn't, I didn't come to the conclusion. If I don't get to heaven, it's because God didn't want me to get there. It ain't nothing that I could have did. Because the only way I'm going to get to heaven is what? Is he bring me there? Huh? He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He said, no man can come to the Father but by me. That sounds like the man that knows the way. That sounds like the man that got the map to the, to the, the destination I want to get to. That sounds like the man who's been there and can show me how to get there. All right? So why would I go out? And, and you see people doing it all the time. Oh, I hope I did enough works. Oh, I hope I made enough good deeds to make it into heaven. 
and you don't know how many good deeds would, would be required. That's one thing you ask yourself. How many good deeds are required to get into heaven? Is it 500? Is it 1,000? Is it 2,000? Did I do 2,000 yet? Can I count them? You don't know. So that's foolish for you to even think that way. Okay, so now, one of the things that keeps many people away from Christ, away from the Bible, and away from salvation is their disagreement with the gospel. It just does not fit what? Their way of thinking. And it, how many of y'all, before you got saved, you know you didn't fit that? You, you said, that sounds stupid. Love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. Huh? Pray for those that despitefully you. That don't, sound, that, that don't agree with my thinking. Huh? That, that God, look, it's an eye for an eye in my books. <laughs> you hit me, I hit you. You curse me, I cut. No, God said, no. Don't curse, but what? Bless. That don't fit your thinking. Huh? And you see, God's word is his wisdom. Haven't you ever found out if you love your enemy, you win your enemy? You put heaps of coal, the Bible says, on his head when he's thirsty and you give him some water to drink. The Bible says you put heaps of coals on his head when he's hungry and you give him something to eat. You know why? Because if I do you wrong, what are you expecting from that person? Get you back. Huh? That's, that's, your, that's your way of thinking. Huh? I for an eye. But God say, love. Huh? And you say, no, that don't make sense. God said, no, you pray for them. That don't make sense. But when you do it, <coughs> and then you begin to see the power of God. Then you begin to see the wisdom of God. <coughs> I heard uh, one, of, one of my professors say one thing. He said, when you got hatred for a person, he said, you really need that individual. He said, because without that individual, you don't have no hatred. So he said, you dependent upon him to keep your hatred alive. He said, now, if you would just release him, guess what? Your hatred would go too. But your hatred stayed there because you feel like oh, that, oh, and you always talking about him. You're always talking. Say, oh, and all that time, you will just on him. Your whole mind, your whole thoughts are on him. He said, because he's become your whole object of joy, your whole life, everything. And he said, if you just dismiss him, all that hatred, all that anger, all that stuff that you have would be gone away. And I found that to be true. Because as long as you see him, as long as you think about him, guess what? You keep on hating him, don't you? But now you get down on your knees and do like what God say. Pray for him. Ask God to bless him. Ask God to do whatever he need in life. Change his heart. Change his mind. Then that hatred turned to what? Love, compassion, mercy. Huh? So, but God's ways just don't fit our thinking. But the thing is, the written word stands for all time, for every age, with all that the word contains. One thing about the word of God, from the time it was printed until today, does it still work? You would think it would run out of style. You would think it would run out of, be out of date. But the Bible is never outdated, is it? It seemed to always fit whatever generation it enters. It doesn't have to change. None of these words changes. It fits. And I'm going to tell you what else happened. God gives us more knowledge. Because as the generation comes, more knowledge comes. And you begin to understand God's word even better. Now, look at verse 20. It says, it says, it says, where is the wise? Where is the scribes? Where is the disputers of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? One question in three parts. Where are all the smart people that have the answers? The very question implied that they have been made fools. All of them have turned out to be what? Fools. Did God consult them when he devised his plan of salvation? 
Can they ever have worked out such a plan of redemption if left to their own wisdom? The answer is no. God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. Let me tell you what happened when man in his own wisdom tries to save himself. It says in the book of Romans, the first chapter in verse 25, it says, In his own wisdom, man has changed the truth of God for a lie. In other words, I know the truth, but I don't believe it. I'm going to take this lie, and I'm going to make it true. He said, man, it's changed, because there's a change. He said, an exchange took place. In other words, he knew the truth, but he said, I ain't going to accept that as being true. I'm going to accept this as being the truth. And say, he said, man, it's changed the truth of God for a lie. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. When man does not accept God's message, when man doesn't accept God's word, huh? then God make him look like a fool. Now, I got to tell you, there are some things that men do. I sometimes wonder how in the world they can do that. I've seen people worship cows. And I say to myself, that boy good enough for a steak sandwich? Some milk, <laughs> some cheese, some whatever. But he ain't nobody I'm going to pray to. In fact, I can't even communicate with him. But people, this is man wisdom. God says, I can speak, I can feel, I can see, I can hear, and I can help you. But instead of him going to what God says in his word, He'll go to a cow. In fact, to show you how stupid he can get, the Bible say he'll go out in the forest and he'll cut down a tree, chop it up. He'll put part of it in the fire to warm him. He'll put part of the tree on the stove to cook his food. And then he'll take the last part and he'll bow down to it and say, save me. Huh? Now, that's his wisdom. The truth is, it's a tree. And it's all that is a tree. The truth is, that's an animal. And all it is, is an animal. But when you exchange truth for a lie, all of a sudden, that's not a cow, that's a god. All of a sudden, that's not a tree, that's a god. You understand? When you take God's wisdom and you put it to the side as foolishness, and you begin to walk in your own wisdom, now, mind you, we can do and think of some crazy things. Can we not? We done got to a point now, we don't know what marriage is. We done got to a point now, we don't know between a man and a woman, a man and a cow, a man and a snake, a man and a bulldog. We don't know what it is. Because God done gave us his definition of what marriage is. He said marriage is between a man and a woman. But we, done, we got to figure it out. We, we, we done went clean to the Supreme Court to find out what marriage is. And it's right there. It's been there for centuries. Everybody has understood what marriage was, but lately, it's confusing now. We, we got to a point now, we don't even know what the sexes are. We don't know if that's a woman or a man, or a man or a woman. We done got all, conf all these things, because when God lets you go use your own wisdom, you won't accept what God says true. You'll start making up your truth and your religion and your ideas. And so the thing is that this him. God make the wise peoples of the world. This is, this is what this, I, um, I think I, I, I know I told the church this. This happened years ago. And all these people were well-educated people. But the man that they was following, he was supposed to be well-educated too. But he was, if you looked at him, you would have thought he was crazy. Just to look at him. But he told these people, he said, look, you need to put 35 cents in your pocket and you need to put on some tennis shoes because the comet that's coming has a spaceship behind it. And to get on the spaceship, you got to drink this poison, have 35 cents in your pocket and have on your tennis shoes and we'll meet that spaceship up there in space. Now, the people that was there, well educated, business folks, all, all they believed him. And they put that 35 cent in their pocket. 
and they put on their tennis shoes and drunk poison, and guess what happened to them? They died. But when you won't accept the truth, you will accept a lie. Because there's only the one place you can go. When you don't accept the truth, there's only one place you can go, and that is to a lie. And see, the thing is, God have told them the truth. I'm the only God there is. There is no other God, huh? But if you seek it for other gods, I guarantee that one will come up for you. All right? So now, let's go to verse 21. It says this here. It says, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them who believe. Now, the world of men fell completely in regard to the one and supreme thing it needed. It did not know God. Man cannot by his own wisdom come to the knowledge of God, much less come to a personal relationship with him. For centuries, God gave the human race this opportunity, and the result was failure. Man never attained to this real knowledge of God. They did not know him. When he speaks to them in the gospel, even today, they laugh. They do not think that it is God speaking. Even the Jews who talk about God and boast about him did not know him. Look at John, St. John 8 and 19. You see, if God gave the world every opportunity to know him. But they just would not seem to know him in all the things that they tried. They tried it, science, they tried it, everything. But in John 8, 19, it says, this is Jesus speaking to the Jews. Then said they unto him, he said, they said, where is your father? Now they're asking the father where he is. Your father. Because they're saying God is their father. Jesus answered, you neither know me nor my father. He said, if you had known me, you should have known my father also. The Jews had the prophets. The Jews had the law. The Jews had the word of God. And with all that, when Jesus came, guess what? They didn't know who Jesus was. They read about him every Sabbath. And when he finally shows up, nobody knew him. The Bible says he came unto his own. His own didn't receive him. The ones who should have known him. I mean, I, I guarantee you, if Deacon Johnson go to his family reunion, his sisters and brothers should know him, shouldn't they? Now, if he walk up there and they say, who that man is? <laughs> I think you can take his head. I've been with y'all for the long for I don't know how long y'all don't know me. You understand? But the thing is that this is him. God provided opportunities. See, God placed man into this universe, which was entirely filled with his wisdom. And yet, despite all this, they did not know him. Now go to Romans 1. Look at verse 19 through 23. <coughs> Bible says this here. Said that because that which, that which may be known of God is revealed in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are what? Without excuse. He said, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible men, the birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Instead of them gaining knowledge of who God is, they begin to turn away from that knowledge and do the exact opposite. You, you, you hear scientists today, these people gaze into the stars, into the universe. They see all different galaxies out there. And all the forms of stars, how they all lined up, how they all in order. And they'll come right back after looking at that for 
centuries, we could say. And they'll come right back, I don't see no God out there. I don't understand why you say there's a God out there. I mean, you say to yourself, how in the world could you sit there and think that the cow made everything? How could you sit there and think that man came from an ape? Has it ever happened since you've been alive? No, but millions and billions of years ago, it did happen. Oh, billions and millions of years ago. That gets me when they always say, millions and millions and billions of years ago. He don't even know what a million and a billion years look like, let alone to tell you what happened back then. But he's just throwing out some words, and people are accepting it. I mean, if a man came from an ape, what changed it? What stopped it? As long as I've been living, the chicken always laid the egg. I haven't seen him lay a fish yet. Haven't seen him lay a dog yet. He's always laid a what? An egg. And it ain't changed. That was like I guess, like I said again, it's the message that God gives them. It doesn't agree with their thinking. It doesn't agree with their wisdom. It sounds simple to you. It sounds simple to me. Chicken lay eggs. It, 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 that sounds simple to me. But for a man, no, no, no. That that that's not how it happened. The egg came. But what brought the egg? The dirt brought the egg. Now, dirt ain't brought the egg yet. As long as I've been living, chicken has always brought the egg. All right? But his wisdom, because he don't want to accept the truth, he makes up his own truth. And he changed the truth into what? Into a lie. Man's sinful nature caused this problem. And he cannot change his nature. Even if human wisdom could know the problem, it doesn't have the power to change it. But God has the power. It was God's good pleasure by the foolishness of preaching the cross, what the world counted as, to save those who would simply believe. It's simple. God told a man who was born blind, had never seen light. He said, go down to the pool and wash. How many of y'all know that man probably had been to that pool before. Probably done washed his face with water before. And then came up blind as I don't know what. But God said, this, 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 is what, this is what, you could be here and did it five times. But like Elijah on the mountaintop, go back again. Because why? God said it's going to rain. Doesn't matter about your experiences or what you've gone through or what other people have gone through that you know. It's what God said. God told a man that was born blind, he just put some mud on his eye. He said, go down there and wash your face. Now, how many of y'all know that has to be crazy? This man ain't never seen. This man was born this way. Now you were saying, if he go down there and wash his face in that water, that he's going to come back seeing? Do you think Jesus followed him? He ain't followed him. He was so sure he was going to see going to come back seeing and say, he didn't even give him his name. <laughs> you would think Jesus would have said, now when you come back seeing, I'm the one who did it. He didn't even give the man his name. The man didn't even know Jesus' name. He didn't even know Jesus. Because when he washed his eyes and he began to see, Jesus wasn't even there. Ain't that so? But just by washing his eyes, a man that was born blind, who believed what God's word said, went down there, came back what? The Bible says he came back seeing. Now, the message of God has power in it. Word of God is powerful. And the Bible tells us it's sharper than any two-edged sword. The message of the cross has power in it. It's a message that has the power of God in it. It's a, it's a message of good news if you'd only believe it. And so the thing is, this here, it was God's good pleasure. So he could take it out the wise people's hand. Take it out of those who study and those who are highly favored among peoples. Take it out of their hands. Make them look like fools. And do something so crazy that nobody would have ever thought of it happening this way. Because I'm telling you something, God always do it the way that nobody else. You can go to the psychologist. You can go to what is his name, Phil, or whatever his name is, Oprah Winfrey. You go to all of them. They won't think of you. They can't resolve your problem. They got problems themselves. People don't understand that. And they can't solve their own problem. But the fact is, God don't have no problems. You know that? He ain't got no problems. 
He ain't got no situation he can't conquer. He ain't got no battle he can't win. He ain't got nobody who can overcome him. This is the kind of person that you need to go to. All right? But now, a message that seemed foolish to men saved those who believe. Whereas the hell, because it was, because it used its own wisdom, God chose the very opposite. He actually took the last thing anyone would expect him to take, foolishness of preaching the cross. Of course, we know that it's not foolishness, but it seemed foolish to the unenlightened mind of man. By employing foolishness where the world used wisdom, God really made a joke of the world and of his lofty wisdom. See, God got to make it so that you know it's him. Because if you can think of it, it ain't God. If you can accomplish it, it ain't God. So God got to do something in such a way that when it's done, you know it's God. I mean, Naaman and all the battles he fought and he won. He couldn't do nothing with that leprosy in his body. And you know what God told him? He, he, he had his own idea. He said, man, look, I thought he'd come on out the door, call on his God, put his hand on the leprosy, and God just healed. That was his idea. And see, God didn't show him none of that. And because God didn't show him none of that, he got, and I'm going to tell you, most of the time, we get upset with what God tells us to do, don't we? Because it does, does not match my thinking. Why would God want me to go down to dirty old nasty Jordan River? I got some pools in my backyard. He said prettier than that. But you telling me, go down the Jordan River, and not only go down the Jordan River, but in that water seven times. And he said, and if you do that, you'll be clean. The Bible said, he said, that sounds foolish. He, he, he said, he, man, I ain't doing that crazy. He went off mad. Thank God somebody along the side had enough sense. He said, if he'd, have if he'd have told you to put on a bozo suit with a big red nose, you'd have did it. Huh? If he'd have told you to run down that street, butt nigga, you'd did it. So why won't you go down the Jordan River and jump down that river seven times? You understand? Some of the things you've done are so crazy. And you sit up there and you say, God want me to do this? What's some of the things you done did for the devil? It's just as crazy. You done been had bullets shot at you. You done, had, you done took overdose. You done drunk yourself drunk the way you can't walk no more. And then you sit up there, what God asked me to do, that's crazy. But look at what you did for the devil. I don't talk about this. I mean, sometimes you ought to just wake up. You drunk yourself so drunk you can't walk. And you say, oh, that's crazy. I ain't going to do that. Why? It's better this way. Than that. And God, no. God got to get that pride out of you. Got to get that where you think you smarter than him out of you. To a point where you believe God's word when God gives you the word. Whatever God tells you to do, do it. Just like Mary told the boys at the wedding, say, look, whatever he tells you to do, she said, do it. They ran out of wine. You know what he say? Go get some water. <laughs> well, water? We need wine. <laughs> but he said, no, you go get some water. And then you fill up 150 gallons worth in the barrels of water. Then he said, you take it and dip it. And give it to the wine taster, the man who know wine, know every good wine, every bad wine. He, and you take it and you give it to him. All in that service mind is water. I know what I put in there was water. I know when I dipped it, it was water. But when he gave it to the wine taster, the man said, boy, this is the best I ever tasted in my life. But you see, he said, Mary gave the key. The key to success, the key to being blessed, the key to being brought out of every situation, the key to overcoming is just do what he say. Don't question it. Just do what he say. It may not make no sense to you because you're trying to put your wisdom with it. When you try to mix your wisdom with God's wisdom, all you do is make a mess. All you do is get in God's way. But the thing is, it is God used something to save the whole world. That nobody else could think of. God did something that nobody would have. Did you ever think preaching would bring you out of the world? 
especially in preaching about Jesus dying on the cross, raising up. Did you ever think that would stop you? No. And God said, yeah, just preach this gospel, and you will save that sinner. You will save that drug addict. You will save that prostitute. You will save that homeless man. Just preach this gospel. That's all you got to do. And, 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 and haven't we seen it do it? You've seen drugs. You've seen prostitutes. You've seen pimps. You've seen homeless people. All lives what? Change just through the preaching of the gospel. And somebody say, what Jesus died on the cross going to do for me and my crack? Just believe. That's all he got to do, just believe. Now, the preaching of the cross, the content of what is proclaimed, to announce as the Savior of the world, one who died a vile death of a criminal on the cross seemed indeed to be foolish. And to expect that this announcement would do what all the world, with all his mighty effort and wisdom, failed to do. Namely, actually to lift man up again into a right relationship with God only intensified the impression of utter foolishness. In all the world, such a scheme was never heard of. And yet this foolishness succeeds. It actually saves. It actually rescues. It actually delivers people. It accomplished the very thing the perishing world needs. But no well to save the believing. This preaching calls for faith, and it received only by what? Faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the water of them that diligently seek. Having faith in God is simply just trusting God. Just believing God's word. Just taking him right at his word. Look at verse 22. He said, for the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek out the wisdom. Huh? Unbelief. It's always the basic reason for not accepting God's will and God's way. But unbelief is expressed in various ways. It was characteristic of the Jews to in my notes right now, to request a sign. Their attitude was that they would believe if they saw some miracle or some supernatural sign was shown to them. The Greeks, on the other hand, searched for wisdom. They were interested in human reasoning and arguments and logic through ideas they could debate. Desire for proof most frequently is an invasion or an excuse for not believing. Jesus performed miracle after miracle. The man born blind was made to see. Also Lazarus was raised from the dead after four days of the grave. And yet the scripture states in St. John the 12th chapter verse 37, it says this here. But despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had done. Most of the people still did not what? I heard some people say, I heard somebody say, man, I wish I was back there in Jesus' time. If I saw those miracles, I would have believed. And people say, I wish I was at the Red Sea. Man, if I see that Red Sea split, ain't nowhere in the world, I would have died of God. Yeah, the saying in the world is this. Seeing is believing. I'm on page four. But how do y'all know that People have seen things with their own eyes and still don't believe. I've seen people go through things, actually be healed, and still don't believe in healing. Now you say, how in the world could you not believe that? <coughs> Same people saw Lazarus go into the grave, saw the stone rolled over his grave, know he was in that grave. For four days. How come a man, four days later, all he did was pray to and called his name? Now, you know he was worm infested. <laughs> Rigamore had already sodded him. He was stinking. And all he did was walk down to that grave that you put him in, say, just roll back the stone, and I'm going to show you something that you won't even believe. And the thing is, all he did was pray, and then he looked at the grave, because he said, I am the life. Now, if you don't believe it, I'm going to show you. I am the resurrection. Now, if you don't believe it, I'm going to show you. And he walked down there, and you got to be life, and you got to be resurrection. If somebody had been in the grave, ready to stay, ready to be ready to go to ashes, and all he do is just call your name, 
And here he come a hipping and a hopping. And you know he was dead. But seeing does not mean that you believe. A lot of things people see, a lot of things people experience, they still yet don't believe. All right? Now, going back to that 23rd verse. Paul says this, he said, but we preach Christ crucified. He said, unto the Jews are stumbling back and unto the Greek. He said, that's foolishness. And I want you to look at a, 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 a little part of that 24th verse. But he said, but unto them which are called. Now, Paul said, but we preach Christ crucified. In the 22nd verse, he said, Jews want a sign. The Greek wants some wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. If you really understood, if you really look at that, he's got both of them. He's got the signs and he's got the wisdom. Huh? Because in order to have the, the signs come to pass, open up the eyes of the blind to raise the dead, you need Jesus. Huh? In order to live right, in order to walk right, you need what? You need Jesus. So he had the sign, but look at what he says here. Combine Jews and Greeks into one great class and place them over against we. Now Paul defined what he means by the foolishness of preaching. What is this foolishness? It's Christ crucified. He said we preach Christ crucified. Christ, the one whom God anointed as our redeemer, died on the cross and won salvation for the whole world. To the Jews Christ crucified was a stumbling block. They looked for a mighty military leader to deliver them from the oppression of Rome. Instead of that, the gospel offered them a savior, a crucified Messiah nailed to a cross of shame. To the Greek, Christ crucified was foolishness. They could not understand how one who died in such seeming weakness and failure could ever solve their problem. The Gentiles wanted something they could figure out with their own mind. But Paul would only preach Christ crucified, the only true sign, and the only true wisdom. Those who will not believe that sign or accept that wisdom will not accept what? God. When you look at the cross, you don't see salvation, do you? When you look at the cross, you don't see power. When you look at the cross, you don't see no deliverance, do you? It's a man on a piece of wood dying. Huh? But my Bible tells me that while he was on that cross, there was a thief on the left and there was a thief on the right. And that thief know that Jesus was hanging just like them. And that thief know that they had a sign over his head saying, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And that was supposed to be his crime. That thief know <coughs> only criminals are crucified. You had to do something wrong to be hanging on that cross. But in spite of seeing all that, in spite of seeing the, 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 the high priests, all the religious peoples, the scribes, and all the doctors and the lawyers standing out there laughing at him, picking at him, this man turned around to Jesus in all that atmosphere, in all that surrounding, and he said, Lord, remember me. Somebody say, how in the world he come up with that? Faith. See, faith doesn't take what's going on into consideration. All faith taken what God said. He told that thing. He said, look, I, I know all the thieves in town. I don't know this fella. I know all the folks who run around town doing wrong. I don't know this fella. He brought that conclusion to his own mind. He said, look, and he's hanging here on the cross like us, and he don't even run with us. He know that something was wrong with that picture. And through all those obstacles that would stop him from believing, the Bible said he did what? He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. See, a lot of times you got to overcome a lot of things that you believe, a lot of things that you trust, and just put God's word first. All right, now look at verse 24. And he said this here. He said, but unto them which are called, both the Jews and the Greek, he said, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. What's contained in the gospel, the word of the cross and the power of God, is Jesus Christ himself. 
Jesus is the power of God, and Jesus is the wisdom of God. God called peoples that were both Jews and Gentiles. And to those who he is called and trust in him, both Jews and Greeks, Christ become the power of God. Now I am saved. Now I can stand. And the wisdom of God. Now I can see and now I can live right. He who is a stumbling block to the unbelieving Jews is a savior to the believing Jews. He who is foolishness to the unbelieving Gentile is a redeemer to the what? To the believing Gentile. See, it's all about faith. Do you believe God's word to be true? Or you believe it to be a lie? It's all about faith in God's word. And see, the Jews say, well, if we got some proof, we'll believe. God gave them all the proof they, they needed, and they still didn't believe. The Greeks say, if we got some wisdom, we'll believe. Gave them all the word they needed. All the wisdom in it, they still didn't believe. You understand? Because it takes faith. Some people say, if, if, if more miracles were being done in the church, we'd have more people in the church. That's a lie. Only thing going to get you in the church is the preaching of the cross. If you don't believe that he died, if you don't believe that he was buried, if you don't believe that he was resurrected from the grave, huh? you will not be saved. I don't care how many blind eyes be open. I don't care how many paralyzed people be raised up. I don't care how many sick people get healed. I don't care how many demon-possessed people get released. If you don't believe that, you will not be saved. God didn't put it on miracles. God put it on faith. If you believe this one gospel, and that's, see, people ain't going to hell because they lied. And they ain't going to hell because they killed. They ain't going to hell because they committed adultery. They're going to hell because of one thing. They didn't believe in the death and the burial and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that sent you to hell. Because if you believe that, <laughs> you're going back with him. That thief was on the cross. He didn't have time to get baptized. He didn't have time to go to church. He didn't have time to change his clothes. But he believed. And guess what? Jesus said, this day shall thou be with me, what? In paradise. All right, let's do this last verse. Verse 25. It says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than man. And the weakness of God is what? Stronger than man. Actually, there's neither foolishness or weakness with God. But the apostles said in verse 25 that what seemed to be foolishness on God's part in the eyes of men is actually wiser than man at their very best. Also, what seemed to be weakness on God's part in the eyes of men turned out to be stronger than anything that man can produce. If man was if men were asked how God should proceed to save the world, they would certainly not say by sending his son to die on the cross. And yet, this is what God did. And behold, this actually saves. So wise is this foolish thing. So powerful is this weak thing. For inherit in his cross, but not outwardly displayed at all, is this strength of God, and wisdom of God that exceeds all that man know. God's power is real power. Power that means something and accomplishes something. It is not of men, but it is offered for men. It is the power of salvation from sin, deliverance from Satan, and life eternal. That's real power. God does not expect men to come to him through their own wisdom. He knows they cannot. But they can come to him through his wisdom, through the preaching of the cross. God saves only those who believe. Man cannot figure out salvation. They can only, it's what? Accept it by faith. Nicodemus say, look, I know you come from God. <laughs> Can't nobody do the things you do except God be with you. You just look straight at him, told him what you need. He said, you must be born again. The nigga deep say, wait a minute now. I'm too old to go back up in my mother's womb. He all, he, 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 see, man is trying to figure out 
spiritual through a natural means, and you can't do it. I want to tell people, don't sit up there and try to figure out who say who ain't say because you can't see the spiritual transaction that took place. That's only between God and that individual. God knows the heart of people. You do not. All you know is what they show. And people can show you a lot that ain't there. Believe me. They can show you some things that are there. But one thing about Jesus said, he said, a tree is known by what? It's fruit. Eventually, the true tree is going to appear. A wolf, even if he got on sheep clothing, sooner or later began to show his teeth. So the thing is that this here, the message of the cross, it may sound foolish to the world, but it has did some powerful things. It has stopped some people the psychiatrists couldn't stop. Huh? It had healed some people the doctors don't know how they got well. Huh? All because of the message of the cross. People have believed God's word, and when they believe God's word, God's word becomes active. Because real power is power that what? Accomplishes something. If it don't accomplish nothing, it ain't no real power. And God's message of the cross is real power. So we thank God for you. Let us stand for dismissal at this time. And lift hand towards heaven. And say, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. And to present you faultless for the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, I will say, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power. Both now and forevermore, all the people of God say, amen. Take somebody's hand and say, Jesus loves you.